This sermon is titled Book Study Acts chapters 1 and 2. Be enriched as you listen. All right, good morning everyone. Are you happy to be here? Are you excited about the new sermon series we're going to do? We're going to spend some time in the book of Acts. Each year, we uh, take some time to study at least one book in the Bible. Uh, and this year, we are going to study the book of Acts. Now, we did not give you your homework last week. <laughs> but for us, what we want us to do during next three months, the book of Acts is quite big. 28 chapters, so we're going to be in it for three months. Uh, we want to request all of us to please read two chapters before you come to the service. So next Sunday, we are going to be doing chapters 3 and 4. Today, we'll do chapters 1 and 2. Next Sunday, we'll be doing chapters 3 and 4. So before you come to the service during the week, please read chapters now, this week, you have to read a lot. You have to read one, two, three, four. To read four chapters this week. But from then on, two chapters before you come to the service, right? So that way, when we get into those chapters, uh, you will know what we're talking about. It'll be easy to assimilate and so on. Um, so please do that. And uh, in the service, we may not be able to read the text because these our chapters are long and so on. So I will just be highlighting things. So I'll be telling it like a story. It's a history book that records what happened in the early church the first 40 years. So we may not be able to read the text during the services, uh, all of it. So please read it at home. Come here prepared and we will journey through the book of Acts. Before we get started, I just want to share two things. One was last weekend we had our youth camp. So last Sunday, the last day, I was away at the youth camp, and I was so encouraged by what I heard and saw. You know, you have, we had about 170 young people away at the camp. They were having fun, they were having a great time, but they were also seeking God. So imagine, you send 170 people away, what will they do? Yeah, they're seeking God. And uh, I was there on the last Sunday, so I got to hear the testimonies. It was just amazing, the testimonies of how the Holy Spirit was working among the youth. They were encountering the Holy Spirit. They were receiving prophecy, and healings, deliverance. Uh, some testimonies, you know, people who've been away from church for a couple of years, two years, three years. They come back to the youth camp. Hearts, giving their hearts back to Jesus. It was so amazing. Uh, them receiving prophetic words, giving prophecy, receiving prophecy. And it was so encouraging to see what God is doing among our young people. Amen? So let's thank God for it. And let this increase. Let this increase. Let it just become more and more and more. Let the Holy Spirit have His free way. Among all ages. I was just reporting on the young people. Let Him have His free way among all, all of our young people. The second thing I want to just share about is last week I was away um, in, uh, in Maharashtra, um, a place away from Nagpur, five, five hours away from on road, away from Nagpur city, uh, just to speak at a pastor's conference. And uh, this was part of Mission Maharashtra, where the, the, you know, they're working on planting churches in and around Maharashtra. Um, so I spent some time, but I really came back with this burden that we as a church need to do, be doing much more in missions in our country. Much more. We are doing quite a bit already. Every month we are supporting 15 people around the 15 of our outreach churches, pastors. Uh, we give to other missions. Our books are going out all across the country. Bible college, we're training our dear precious students who have come from 13 states. Uh, our regular Bible college. So there's a lot that's already going on. But having spent time with these pastors, seeing what, I mean, of course, we were ministering to them, sharing about church planting and so on, and just listening to all the stories and meeting other pastors and ministers. I just said, look, we are not doing enough. We are actually very comfortable sitting here. 
you know, we have such a nice auditorium and all these things. But there you're going, you're sitting out in the heat, sitting and listening to God's word the whole day. I mean, the temperature there is <laughs> up in the 40s. Sitting outside, listening to God's word in that heat. And then they go and they are serving God in villages and town. Oh, I said, God, we have to do so much more. So, of course, we are partnering with other mission organizations. Uh, one of the things that was present, one of the part of our discussions was, uh, uh, if we can do training in the next six months, uh, cover about six to eight cities. Now, they will bring, in each city, they'll bring about 500 pastors from the remote areas. They'll bring them to the city, so make it easy for us. We just fly into the city. <laughs> But they will bring the pastors from the remote areas there. there. Keep them there for three, three days. We go, we train, we talk to them about church. They've already, been gone, already gone through some basic training in terms of evangelism, discipleship. Now we take them forward on how do you establish churches and communities of believers and so on. Uh, we have the resources. We have a book called House of God. We have other material that we can use. But what we want to challenge us is to at least go for three days. We're not asking you to go for three months or not even three weeks. Three days in a year. Can you go? Of course, you give one day extra for travel. Uh, we will share with you that what we're doing. But, you know, six to eight cities. So make it easy for us. Go from Bangalore to one of the cities. We get the pastors there. You spend time sharing about this, this, the next phase is about church planting. Yeah, and we have the content, so you prepare yourself. We will help you, help prepare you. And then we send a team, because it's three days, you know, about five sessions every day, so it's 15 sessions. One person can't do it. We send a team, three or four people, share the sessions. But you serve them, so that when they go back to their remote places, they will be able to do a better work. That's the objective. So, we're going to be sharing that with you. I mean, I'm not asking you, you know, quit your job and go. That's not what we said. <laughs> At least three days. You want to do more, you can. You can. But three days in a year. Plan. Take some, you know, we all have leaves from work. Go. Uh, pick a city, wherever. North India, we can tell you this. Go serve. Now, if you want to go to any of our outreach churches, you can. You go there. So, so will say, well, the church pay my ticket. Well, that's part of your mission contribution. You buy your own ticket. <laughs> right? Don't ask us to do everything for you. It's your contribution to missions. Buy your own ticket. Go. Give three days. Serve the people. And come back. And if you want to do much more, you want to go into the places let us know. We've got these churches out in difficult places. And you can go, you can sell. But I just feel we are very comfortable here. You know. Uh, we need to do a lot more. Right? So stay open. Pray about it. See what God will move you to do. And let's do something. Amen? All right. Let's uh, get into our study today. The book of Acts, just a little bit of introduction. The book of Acts records the first 40 years of the early church. Now, these sermon notes are already available. You can download them from our church website, put them on your phone, follow along. Or you can, if you're using the church app, it's already in the church app. So you can download it, follow along with me right now. If you want to do it, you're welcome. You're free to use your phone as long as you're using the sermon notes. <laughs> So the notes are available on the website or on the church app. So you can download it or you can follow the outline that comes on the screen. So the book of Acts records the first 40 years of the early church. And in, in a sense, it's a history, a record of history, of things that actually happened. And as we study the book of Acts, we are not so much interested necessarily in the history or in the culture, but we are looking at what are the practical and spiritual insights we can draw 
from the book of Acts. So that's going to be our focus. The practical spiritual insights that we can receive from the book of Acts as we read through the first, uh, first 40 years. What happened in the life of the early church? The author is Luke. He wrote the gospel of Luke and he also wrote the book of Acts. We don't know too much about Luke except for a few things that we do know. He was Greek. See, but not necessarily uh, a, a, a Greek who became a believer in Jesus. He most likely became a believer in the city of Antioch in Syria. How did that happen? When the believers in Jerusalem, there was persecution, they were scattered. Some of them went far north from Jerusalem up to Antioch, the city of Antioch in Syria. They went up there. And so it's most likely that that was a time he met, he heard the gospel and he became a believer. And so Antioch was his home church. Now Antioch also became the home church of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was brought, came to the city of Antioch, that was his home church. So Luke became a close associate of the Apostle Paul. And he did travel with Paul on some of those missionary journeys. Luke was a medical doctor. We read, read about this in the book of Colossians. Uh, so it's very interesting that he uses medical terms in his writings, which you don't find in the writings of the other uh, epistles uh, or the uh, other gospel writers. So he uses medical terms. It comes through in his writing. He also, for us, he records 18 sermons that were preached. He records them in the book of Acts. So if you want to learn how to preach, study these sermons. And this is how they preached in those days before they went to Bible college. <laughs> so he records these sermons for us in the book of Acts, and we will be looking at them. Uh, from Luke's perspective of the book of Acts, there are four what we refer to as we sections. That means four sections in the book of Acts. Luke suddenly changes his language from they to us or we. That means he was there. Acts 16, Acts 20, Acts 21, Acts 27. We. I was there. I was with Paul. I was with his team. So the language changes. That means in these sections, he was actually part of the action, what was happening. The other way to divide the book of Acts is by time periods. And if we choose to do it that way, we can divide the book of Acts into three sections. The first section is from eight, the first eight years. From that's Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 7. The first eight years of the church. In those eight years, the church was really focused in Jerusalem. What was happening? So we get an insight into that. Then we have the next 10 years. The next time period. The next 10 years. Acts chapter 8 on to Acts chapter 12, the next 10 years. What happened? The church now spread all across the region. So they go from Jerusalem to all the cities around. The third time period that we can divide the book of Acts into is Acts chapter 13 till the end, Acts 28, the next 20 years. And this focuses on the life of the Apostle Paul, the ministry of the Apostle Paul, as God uses him, of course, God was working through all the other apostles as well. But the central person, central figure of the, in, the, in the next chapters from Acts 13 to 28 is the Apostle Paul. As he travels all across Asia Minor, he crossovers into Europe, takes the gospel all the way to Rome, and he even travels all the way to Spain uh, carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's how you can divide the book of Acts if you want to divide it by time period. There are two important things or perspectives that we get through the book of Acts, which is something I want us to focus on. Two things. One, the first one is the DNA of the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. What kind of church did Jesus originally build? Without LED screens. And amplifiers and big auditoriums and 
cameras and crews. What did that church look like? Where do you get it? The book of Acts. So really, our journey to the book of Acts is going to give us insight into the DNA of the church. This is what the church is supposed to look like. I'm talking about the life of the church. How, you know, of course, in different parts of the world, it has become taken on the local expression. People dress the way they do and uh, they use their local language and they may use some of their local customs. All that is good. But the essence, what should the church really look like? The book of Acts. We're going to see. And I want to invite all of us to try to emulate that. Try to be like the church we see in the book of Acts. The simplicity, the passion, the boldness, the courage, the supernatural, the vibrancy of believers empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's what we need to capture. Amen. And I pray that that will happen to us as we journey through the book of Acts. The second perspective that, that is very important, which we need to understand is how the church should fulfill the Great Commission. Because before His ascension, the Lord Jesus gave the Great Commission. He said, go make disciples. He didn't tell them how. He didn't say, follow these 10 steps. He said, go make disciples. Go your witnesses. Go make disciples. And He had only one instruction. Wait till the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's all. Wait till the Holy Spirit comes. Then go make disciples. But how do you do it? Well, the book of Acts unfolds the strategy of the Holy Spirit for world evangelization and discipleship to fulfill that great commission. What is the strategy? And if we were to summarize it in one sentence, it would be this. That the strategy of God to fulfill to carry out world evangelization and discipleship is the establishing of local churches. That comes through the book of Acts. So as we journey through the book of Acts, see this unfolds. What did the disciples do? They established communities of believers. When we say local churches, it doesn't always have to be a big building. The churches. I mean, it's important to have a building so we can all gather together in a quiet way. So I'm not disregarding the importance of having a building. What I'm saying is this community where believers in Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, are journeying through life together in their region, wherever they are placed. That becomes God's strategy. Because everything reproduces after its own kinds. When you have a spiritual community, then that community is able to reproduce more spirit-filled communities. And that is what happens in the book of Acts. The fire spreads as communities of believers are established everywhere. And that whole region receives the gospel and God's kingdom is established here on earth and continues to be established. So these two perspectives are very important. Which as we journey to the book of Acts, this unfolds for us. So let's go into Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 verse 1, Paul addresses a man named Theophilus. Not Paul, Luke, sorry. Luke, the writer of Acts, he addresses a man named Theophilus. Now, we don't know too much about Theophilus. Some of the conclusions we can come to are that this is a Roman name. So, Theophilus probably was a Roman. So, he wasn't Jewish, a Roman man, a, group, a Gentile who had become a believer. And in the Gospel of Luke, Luke states that Theophilus has, is a believer in Jesus and he has been taught about Jesus Christ. 
So Luke wrote the gospel of Luke to this man, Theophilus, must have been a very important Roman person to have a, for Luke to sit down and write a whole gospel just for this man. So I'm writing this to you. So I want you to know about Jesus. So he wrote the gospel of Luke for this man. And then he continues, book of Acts. He said, Theophilus, I want to tell you about the, the next 40 years. I mean, what else happened after Jesus ascended to heaven? So this record of the early church, written by, the, by Luke, was addressed to this Roman believer, Theophilus, in order to share with him an account of what happened. Of course, God is behind all this. He was thinking about you sitting here today, listening to the sermon, and said it's for them too. Amen? So say this to me, it's for me too. Not just for you, Theophilus. It's for me too. So God used the Luke to record that for us. So he says, Theophilus, I'm writing this to you. In the, opening, in the opening statements in Acts chapter 1, Paul, Luke says, what I'm saying by Paul, Luke says, the Lord Jesus revealed himself by many infallible proofs. Acts 1 verse 3. Many infallible proofs. The apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, that not only did the 12 apostles see Jesus, but there were 500 others who saw him alive. So try to imagine this in your mind. These early believers, they were not believing a myth. They were not believing some story. They saw the risen Lord with their own eyes. So Luke is saying, Jesus showed himself alive for 40 days with many infallible proofs. Meaning we saw him. So they're not, they've not been deceived into some myths. No, they saw the whole thing. They saw him nailed on the cross. They saw him put in a tomb, sealed. They saw the Roman gods standing in front of those tombs. Three days later, the gods run away in fear. The tombstones rolled away. The tomb is empty. And they see the risen Jesus for the next 40 days. We are not believing a myth. We are not believing some story. We, this is infallible, unquestionable. You cannot doubt this. We saw him. We saw the whole thing. For 40 days. So Luke says, the Lord, through many infallible proofs, made revealed himself to us. Keep this in your mind. Next thing I want to highlight, Acts 1 verse 3 is, you know, the last words of a person is very important. Because they want to talk the real serious thing. In the last 40 days, what was Jesus talking about? It says he was speaking to them. Of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He began his ministry announcing the kingdom of God. Last 40 days. He's talking about the kingdom of God. God's kingdom. What does it mean? It's about God's rule. It's about God's reign, His dominion in your life and through your life. That's what He's focusing on. This is most important. God needs to rule in you, rule through you. That's what He's talking about. In the beginning, He taught things like, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Everything will be taken care of. He said, the kingdom of God is like a treasure in a, in a field. When somebody knows it's there, they sell everything they have because they can go buy it because they want that treasure, meaning you've got to give everything for the kingdom. He said things like, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. He said things like, if you want to enter the kingdom, you've got to hum be like a child and you come into the kingdom. He said things like, unless you 
press in with violence and determination, you will not press into the kingdom. The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. So he taught so many things about the kingdom. Being childlike to receive the kingdom. Being warrior-like to press in. All these things are the dynamics of the kingdom. And he said, God is giving you the, the keys of the kingdom. Meaning, he's entrusting the kingdom to you. The keys in your hands. So you better know something about the kingdom. Amen. It is so important. Last 40 days. Stalking about the kingdom. Amen. Small advertisement. We have a little book outside called the kingdom of God. So if you want to learn something more about the kingdom of God, please pick up that free book. It has all the scriptures on the kingdom. But the important thing is we must understand. Because that's what Jesus was talking about in his last days on earth. Kingdom kingdom so he spoke to them about the kingdom and the next thing he said Acts 1 verse 5 4 and 5 he reminded them he said John baptized you with water to repentance but you are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days from now in other words go and wait till you are baptized in the Holy Spirit so as believers, we must understand there are at least three baptisms in the Bible. There is water baptism, which is going to happen today after the service. Those of you who have come prepared, water baptism, what is it? You are baptized in water. Acts 1.5, baptism in the Holy Spirit. What is that? You're immersed in the person of the Holy Spirit. When you become a believer, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you're baptized into Christ. So three baptisms. One, you're baptized into Christ. The moment you become a believer, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you're baptized into Christ. You become part of Jesus. You're immersed. It happens when you become a believer. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. Second, uh, there's no particular order of the second and the third. I'm just mentioning it. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. Now you're overwhelmed by the Spirit. Third baptism, you're baptized in water. Who baptizes you? One believer baptizes you in water. Each one has different significance. But there are three baptisms here. So Jesus is talking about this, the baptism of the Spirit. He says you need to Wait in Jerusalem until you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 verse 5. The purpose of this baptism is in Acts 1 verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. So go wait. Now. I want you to think about this. These disciples have been given this instruction. Go and wait. At that time, they're asking their question. What is the question they're asking? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Meaning like, wait, wait, wait. You haven't finished your job yet. <laughs> You're supposed to become king. I mean, we've been following you for three years. We're so happy you died and rose up again. We're so relieved you're alive. You're supposed to become king. We're supposed to be sitting at your right hand and left. What's that? When is that going to happen? And that's when he says, verses 6 and 7, It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has in His own hands. He says, look, God has a plan. He has a plan for humanity. He knows when he's going to do these things. There is a time when this Jesus is going to sit on the throne and he's going to rule and reign on the earth. Revelation 20 verse 4 says he will rule and reign a thousand years. Daniel chapter 7 talks about him ruling and the saints being, the kingdom being given to the saints. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, don't you know that the saints will rule the earth? 
So it's there. But there's a time for that. It wasn't there at that time. So God has his timings. He will do it. Don't worry. You know, nowadays people make laugh at us. You believe in God. Where is your God? Why is he allowing so much bad things? So many bad things happen. If you say God is a good God, why is the devil around on the earth? Why is he doing all these evil things? Where is God? There's war, there's violence, there's injustice, there's all kinds of evil. Where is the God? Is he a good God? What's he doing? Ah, understand times or seasons. Meaning, read the book. There's a time coming when there will be new heavens and a new earth. And in that new earth, the heaven on earth, the Bible says, there will be no evil inside that kingdom. There's no evil. There will no tears, no death, no pain. It'll be the way God wanted it to be. So, but why can't God do it now? Why is he letting all this going on? Because God doesn't look at time like you and I. A thousand years is like a day for him and a day is like a thousand years. Meaning he's living outside time. You and I are in time. And so for us, it's like, God, this is getting too much. Hurry up, God. God's outside time. For him, time is now and now is time. He lives in the eternal now. There's only now. He is the I am. Not the I was and I'm going to be. I am. Everything is now. His now starts from eternity past and ends in the eternity future. All of that is now for God. He's living outside time. So this is nothing for him. For you and me, it's a big problem. But understand, God's got those times in his hands. Amen? Your responsibility and mine is to make sure we enter that kingdom. You really want to be in a world where there is no pain, no injustice, no evil, no devil? It's coming. Just make sure you get in there. Amen? Don't let your questioning keep you out of the reality of it. Believe. Have faith. It's coming. But it is in His time. Amen? Amen? So, Jesus, the Father's time. You wait until you receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then, the next thing, Acts chapter 1. Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives. About 120 people are gathered with Him that time. And suddenly, gravity loses its power. He ascends. And they're all looking up at him ascending. And there are two angels standing next to him saying, People from Galilee, why stand you gazing like this? This same Jesus, whom you've seen go, will come in like manner as you've seen him go. Now they have the assurance that Jesus is coming back. The same Jesus is coming back. Now, try to put yourself in the lives or in the shoes of these early believers. Try to put yourself, try to get their emotion. They know Jesus is alive. No doubts. We've seen him. They know he ascended to heaven. Have we saw him? They don't know when he's coming back. Because Jesus said, that's in the Father's hands. He gave them an instruction. Go wait in Jerusalem. He gave them a commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. And you're there in that moment. I've seen Jesus. I know he's real. I've seen him go. I don't know when he's coming back. He told me to go and wait because the Holy Spirit is coming. He's given me a job to do. I have to be his witness to the ends of the earth. What are you going to do?
at that moment? What would you have done? The Bible has this beautiful picture for us. Acts 1.14 That these 120 disciples with one accord spent the next 10 days praying. What would you have done? Here's what they did. They went one accord, meaning no arguments. Hey, should we do it? Should we not? Did you really see him? Did you not see him? Is he really coming back? Not coming back? Is the Holy Spirit coming? Not coming? Are we supposed to know? No, no, no. No questions. One accord. United. What are we going to do? Be here. He said, wait. I said, no questions. No arguments. No discussion. No debate. They were one accord. I'm just praying. What would they have prayed? I don't know. I'm just trying to imagine. Lord Jesus, you told us to wait. We are here. Lord, you said you will send the Holy Spirit. We are here. Lord, you said go make disciples. Lord, we have no clue how to do this, but we are ready. We are here. I was imagining. How would they have prayed? What's interesting is this. In that upper room, Acts 1.14, the Bible says there were these 120 believers along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. His brothers are also sitting there. Why is that important? Ah. Because his brothers did not believe in him during his earthly ministry. John chapter 7. During his earthly ministry, when Jesus went about preaching and doing all the miracles, the brothers didn't believe in him. Ah, he must be doing some trick. I mean, he didn't teach us this trick when we were playing marbles, but he has some trick up his sleeves. He's just deceiving the people. They didn't believe in him. His own brothers. Because they all grew up, right? Grew up together. They played around in the dust and dirt and they played together. Now suddenly, he's preaching. People are following me. He's working medics. Ah, something has gone here. Yeah. Maybe dad taught him some tricks he didn't teach us. Or something, I don't know. But the Bible says, his brothers didn't believe in him during his earthly ministry. And now Acts 1.14. Hey, you saw him crucified. Now you're sitting in the upper room. Praying for 10 days. Something has changed. Something has changed. What? Only one thing. He rose up from the dead. This is a big evidence. That Jesus Christ rose up from the dead. His own brothers who didn't believe in him before. Are now sitting quietly in the upper room with the mother. The same people who rejected him. Are now sitting, praying, waiting for the Holy Spirit. What happens? Only one thing. He rose up from the grave. That's the only thing. Big evidence that Jesus rose up from the grave. One last thing from the Acts chapter 1. So in those 10 days, the 11 apostles, Judas had killed himself, the one who betrayed Jesus. They decided to replace Judas. So they did something that you and I don't do. They cast lots. Why we don't do it is because they didn't at that time. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. We do. The Bible tells us you and I are led by the Spirit of God. Not led by lots. Led by the Spirit of God. Right? 
So it's okay for them at that time. They had still not yet, you know, received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and not yet started this journey. They were transitioning from the old to the new. Just, uh, it's okay for them. So in the Old Testament, they practiced that, casting lots. And they believed that God would guide them through the casting of the lots. They pick, you know, if you have two, you know, two people that you pick, had to pick from, Matthew. Matthias, Bartholomew, put the label, pick one, oh, Matthias, Matthias, you got selected, congratulations, you know. Uh, it's okay for them. They did it like that under the Old Testament. But you come into the New Testament, we've got the written scriptures, we've got the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. So, they did that at that time, it was okay for them. We don't do that. We pray. And we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. We read the Bible. God speak to me. Right? So they found Matthias to replace Judas. And now we come to Acts chapter 2. You all with me so far? In chapter 2. The way God did things is so strategic. In the Old Testament, God had instituted seven feasts, seven feasts for His people, which they will do every year. The feast of the Passover was the time when they killed the Passover lamb that was instituted when God brought them out of Egypt. And here, A.D. 30, on the day of the Passover, Jesus Christ is crucified. The real Passover lamb. Three days after the Passover is the feast of the first fruits. It's the first of the barley harvest. On that day, Jesus Christ rose up from the dead. Fifty days after the feast of the first fruits is the feast of Pentecost. That's why it's called Pentecost. Pente, Penta, fifty. Fifty days. That's the harvest festival. So you had the first fruits on the feast of the first fruits. Fifty days later, all the harvest is there. That's the harvest festival. The Feast of Pentecost. And on that day, God poured out the Holy Spirit. It's very interesting. He didn't just wake up one morning, oh, oh, oh today we have to get Christ crucified. No, no, no. Everything plans. Gave the feasts in the Old Testament. One day we will study about the feasts of Israel. And gave, the, gave them the feasts. And then, so beautifully, Christ is crucified. Christ is resurrected. And the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. Now, why is this important? Because you look at the background. Because Jews or Jewish people from all around the region, all over Northern Africa, the Middle East, and modern day Turkey, some even across the other islands from Cyprus and others, they would all make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem for those feasts. And they came to Jerusalem and stayed in Jerusalem for that 60 day period. From Passover till Pentecost. They came. So, again, this is only an estimate. There's no way to verify it. But Jerusalem could be estimated to have a population of 100,000 people. But during that time, it became five times more. We had all the visitors coming. About 500,000 people. From all different parts around that region. And on that day... They're all there. God says, that's the day. 
I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit. See, God has got everything planned. There's a purpose behind everything. So, the disciples, of course, didn't know any of this. They're just, he told us to wait. We are waiting. God, this is day number 10. <laughs> when is the Holy Spirit coming, God? <laughs> just praying. One accord, praying. Tenth day. Ten days over. Wake up in the morning. They're praying. And the Bible says, Acts 2 verse 4, Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. Like a rushing mighty wind, it filled the whole room where they were sitting. So they were on a second floor room, upper room. It filled the whole room. And tongues of fire descended on them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues. As the Holy Spirit enabled them. This is completely new. You don't see any of this in the Old Testament. Nowhere in the Old Testament people being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking with tongues. Very unusual, very unique to the church. Now you try to imagine this. In those days we didn't have, they didn't have cars and the streets were not that big. Must have been, have been a narrow street called First Street. I don't know what the name of the street was. but And there is this... A second floor room and the streets are crowded with people and suddenly from that window in the second floor room you're hearing perfect Telugu and perfect Tamil and perfect Malayalam and hey what is going on it's coming out of that room something unusual is happening and then you're listening. What, what, what are they saying? Oh, they are declaring the wonderful works of God. What's going on? Because in the city were people. They were not all from Jerusalem. They had come from different parts of the world. They had come. And now in there, in, the Jer in Jerusalem, they are hearing language from the city where they came. It's very unusual. And they're listening to it. And it's talking about God. The wonderful works of God. A crowd gathers. Hey, what is going on? What's going on? And their reaction is very interesting. The Bible says, of course, some were amazed. We all would be. Some were perplexed. Kya ho raha hai? <laughs> Some are confused. I don't know what to make of this. And some even mocked. Make fun of it. And sadly that still happens in our world today. When there is the work and the move of the Holy Spirit. Some are amazed. Thank God for it. Some can't understand how. What is this happening? Some are confused. And some even laugh. Ah, this cannot be God. They laugh. They don't understand. So don't be surprised if the Holy Spirit is working in you and you find, get experience different reactions from people around you. It's just common. It happened then, happens today. That's how people respond. When they don't went to the work of the Holy Spirit, not everybody understands. And so some people come to this conclusion. Ah, these men are all drunk with new wine. Tell me, when did you hear people who are drunk speak the wonderful works of God? That itself is a miracle. These men are all drunk. So, I want to just make a comment here that this phenomenon of speaking in tongues is a repeatable experience. We see it continued through the book of Acts. The sound of a rushing mighty wind and tongues of fire doesn't repeat. 
But speaking in tongues and being filled with the Spirit repeats throughout the book of Acts. And so keep that in mind because we, we will see later on that it's meant for you and me as well. Right? So going back now. So Peter feels responsible to give an explanation. He stands up as usual. Nothing prepared. Ex tempo. Nothing prepared. I mean, Jesus didn't prepare Peter for this. Peter studied the Old Testament. All this is going to happen. You have to preach the first sermon. No, nothing. But the Holy Spirit had him, was on him. And so that message that he preached, start to finish, was fresh from the Holy Spirit. So very interesting to look at the outline, the four-point outline, Peter's sermon. Those of us who would like to have outlines, you can break it down. So Peter stands up. And remember, this is not anything prepared. What does he say? He says, men and brethren, these men are not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now remember, Peter is not a Bible scholar. It's all coming from the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, Brethren, what you're seeing happen now is a fulfillment of prophecy. Remember Joel? Now all of them are Jewish people. Of course they know Joel. Of course they know what the prophet Joel said. And Peter saying, hey, this is what he had spoken. He got their attention. Wow. What Joel, the prophet, spoke is being fulfilled. He got their attention. This is what the prophet spoke. God will pour out his spirit on all flesh and they will see visions. They'll have dream dreams. And uh, on my men servants and maid servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit and this will happen. The next point in Peter's sermon is he points to the the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. Acts 2 verse 22. He says, Jesus, a man anointed, attested by God among you with signs and wonders and miracles, which God did through him in your midst. Him you have taken and you have crucified. But God has raised him from the dead. And God has exalted him. So he's talking about Jesus. Second point. Very important for us. Point to Jesus. His life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. Who he is today. Point to Jesus. And then he says. He points to David. He said, David prophesied. About the resurrection. David said. You will not allow my soul to remain in hell. You will not allow my soul to see corruption. So, you know David? Oh. Of course they all know David. David prophesied. Yeah. He prophesied about the resurrection. So he points to David. They are paying attention now. Because David is an important patriarch of their faith. They've been listening. So David said, God will raise this person up from the dead. And that is what has happened. And he points to the glorified Christ. He is exalted at the Father's right hand. And therefore he has shed his Holy Spirit now. What you're seeing happen, the Holy Spirit, is evidence that Christ is seated at the Father's right hand. Simple sermon. Nothing complicated. But see the effect of a simple Holy Spirit anointed sermon. The Bible says when they heard these words, they were cut to the heart. In other words, they were deeply convicted. So when you and I, when we preach the gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 
What can we expect? You don't have to convict people. The Holy Spirit will convict them. That's why on Sunday mornings, we just give an invitation. Why? Because you don't have to tell everybody they're going to hell and they'll repent. No, no, just the Holy Spirit will convict them. And the word of God is being preached. Something inside them will turn and say, I need this Jesus. That's what happened. They were cut to the heart. And what was their response? Their response was, what should we do? In other words, hey, something is happening. We need to respond to this. Tell us, what should we do? And Peter gives the altar call. Repent. Calls him for baptism. Be baptized. You'll be saved. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Meaning full package for you. You, you, you believe in Jesus. You repent. Be, be baptized. You'll be saved. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want to highlight this one particular verse. Acts 2 verse 39. Very important. You all with me so far? Just look at your neighbor. Hope they're not just going off into visions and dreams. <laughs> Verse 39. Peter tells them, For this promise, that means this promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you, is to your children, is to all who are far away, and to as many as the Lord our God will call. This promise, the gift of the Holy Spirit, is for as many as the Lord our God will call. Is God calling people today? Yes. So that promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit, which happened on the day of Pentecost, that, if you want to use the term, that Pentecostal experience, or whatever you want to call it, that charismatic experience, whatever language you want to call it, that infilling of the Holy Spirit or the baptism that is for you and me today use what language you're comfortable with it doesn't matter but you need to have the experience be filled with the Spirit pray in other tongues he said it's for as many as the Lord our God will call it's for every person whom God will call he said this promise is for you it's for your children it's to all who are far away and it's as many as the Lord our God will call the last section, Acts chapter 2, verses 44. So, Acts 2, 40, it says, 3,000 people responded. Beautiful. One message, 3,000 people. So now you have a community. From 120, it's become 3,000. 3,000 people believe in Jesus. What do you do? Hey, Jesus didn't tell us what to do. What do we do? 3,000 people. I mean, we have a youth camp, but 200 people is like a lot of work. <laughs> you have 3,000 people camping in Jerusalem. What do you do? Ah, oh, Acts 2, 44 to 47. Beautiful. What did these people do? This is the DNA of church. This is what Church, life, and community is supposed to be. Of course, it builds from here. We will continue. But look at this very carefully. What was going on? Well, there was a teaching. They, the, the, the apostles continued to teach them. And at that time, they had only two sources. One was the Old Testament. So they went back to the same Old Testament, which they had been reading for hundreds of years. But now with Revelation. So there was a revelation or revelatory teaching of the scriptures. And second, they had the teaching of Jesus. For three years they were with him. They heard the stories, the parables, the teaching. So that's what they gave to these new believers. From the Old Testament, we teach you about Jesus. And we teach you the things he has taught us. They didn't have church app, scroll, <laughs> read, Bible, nothing. Various languages, translations. They didn't have all that. They had to just listen. The apostles taught. Second, the Bible says here, Acts 2, 44 to 48, there were signs and wonders being done. 
That means this community that was spirit-filled was experiencing the supernatural, and we also must. Amen. So you pray, God, we want more. More healings, more miracles, more deliverances, more lives changed, more wonderful things happening, more people being blessed. That has to keep on, have increased it, Lord. Then there were practices, spiritual practices. What do they practice? Worship, prayer, fellowship, and generosity. They worship together. They prayed together. They fellowship together. They ate bread together. Went house to house. They ate bread. And they cared for each other. Because all of them, or many of them, had come from other places. And they were suddenly like, hey, I booked my return ticket for yesterday, but forget the return ticket, I'm staying. So, we had to adapt to life in Jerusalem. I don't know when this is going to finish, but I'm here. So they cared for each other. And the Bible says, as they were continuing like this, with worship and prayer and fellowship and uh, caring for one another, it says they had favor with all the people. Now persecution came. Of course, persecution will come. But favor. People see this community and say there's something different about these people. Something different in the spiritual community. Look at them worship. Look at them pray. Look at them listen to the, the teaching. Look at them how they care for each other. There's something that they had favor. And verse 48 says, the Lord kept adding to the church. I mean, it just kept growing. More people started getting, kept get, getting saved. Das, worship team, please come. These are the characteristics of a spirit-filled community. And this is what we must emulate. This is what you and I as a church community must be like. Are you with me? This is what Jesus, the church that Jesus started. It looked like this. They were receiving the word. There was a supernatural Holy Spirit was working. People were worshipping together, praying together. They were sharing with one another. They were fellowshipping with one another. Of course, when you say 3,000 people, they were doing this in homes. Now we have to organize life group. Which life group you go to? Are you going? But this was happening spontaneously. They did not have a life group coordinator and... <laughs> All those things. It was happening spontaneously. May it happen spontaneously amongst us. Amen? You make friends. Now, of course, we try to organize in some way, but we need to go beyond that. May it happen just spontaneously. You make friends. You fellowship. You pray together anytime. You don't need to get any license to pray. Pray anywhere, anytime. Worship anywhere, anytime. Read the Bible anywhere, anytime. Just a spiritual community. Expect miracles anywhere, anytime. And that's what we should emulate. That's what we should seek to become. Amen? Next Sunday, please come prepared with chapter 3 and 4. So during the week, at home, you read 3 and 4. So when you come, it will be easy to, for us to just speak. We, we're not going to turn and read every verse. I'll just give you a summary and we'll journey how the church went from there, what all happened, what practical and spiritual insights we can take from the book of Acts. Now, this morning, I just want us to take a few moments to pray. Like we heard, as believers... The promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit for, is for us today. Peter said, it's for as many as the Lord our God will call. So some of us may be believers. Uh, we are believers, maybe even baptized in water, and that's wonderful. 
But maybe you have not had the experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's very simple. The Lord Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. So all you have to do is to ask Him, Lord Jesus, baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Spirit on me. Don't worry about the language. You can call it baptism. You can call it outpouring, infilling, charismatic experience, Pentecost. Use whatever language. He understands everything. Say what you want. But Lord, pour out your Spirit on me. Simple. And help me receive power to be a witness. That was his instruction. Wait. So the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll receive power to be my witness. And what we saw happen, Acts 2, which I mentioned is a repeatable experience, is that they began to speak with tongues. They received all the gifts of the Holy Spirit and one of the gifts began to manifest. That was speaking in tongues. So we're going to take a few moments right now to pray. Those of you watching online can join us. If you've never had this experience where you said, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit on me, baptize me, and I want to pray in tongues. If you've never had that, I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. And right now as you are seated in a very simple way, nothing complicated. You just take a step of faith. Ask Him. And the Lord Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit right where you are. And you can start praying in other tongues. Just like we saw in Acts 2. You can start praying. It's for you. It's for as many as the Lord our God will call. So if you've never had this experience, I invite you. You can just pray with me. And a simple instruction after we finish praying and thanking Jesus, don't say anything in your own language. Because the Holy Spirit is going to give you a language. It could be the language of men or of angels. So don't try to figure it out. Is it German? Is it Spanish? Is it French? I am planning to move to Spain, so Holy Spirit give me Spanish. No, 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 no. Don't know. Just, He will give you the language. Could be the language of men or of angels. You just release it. But it deepens your prayer life. It helps you pray deep mysteries to God and strengthen your life. So if you'd like to join me in that prayer, let's do that. We did this in the earlier service. And there were a couple of people who had that experience for their first time. Do it again. So you've never had this before. Just join me with this prayer if you'd like to. If you're a believer in Jesus, you can just pray with me. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I ask you to baptize me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I receive power to be witness for Jesus Christ. And Lord, I receive all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And right now, I open my mouth to speak in the languages given to me by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just those of you who are already praying in tongues, just quietly pray in tongues where you are. Those of you who just joined me in this prayer, I want to encourage you, just open your mouth. And say whatever comes. A language is made of sounds. So just make whatever sound you feel coming out of your spirit. I am going to be praying in tongues. You don't have to copy me. People around you will be praying in tongues. You don't have to copy any of them. Just whatever comes out of your own spirit. You speak it. The same Holy Spirit who moved in Acts chapter 2 is moving here. 
The same Jesus who poured out His Spirit then is pouring out His Spirit here. And for those of you watching online, you can pray right there. Open your mouth and just begin to speak with other tongues. As the Holy Spirit gives you utterance, and Lord, in this auditorium, let many, many, many people begin to speak in tongues for the very first time. Open up their spirits, let heavenly languages flow. Thank you, O God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Just go ahead, pray. Pray as the Holy Spirit gives you utterance. I'm going to pray. You don't have to copy me. I'm just speaking in tongues, talking to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. How my sin is so my command it is true. It is a mara so man de can de 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 sto. Can de de mi so mara sa. It is a se de 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 de. Oh, my son, de de astro. Que <speaking in Spanish> Ede amaroso mande de de aka Ede ababa baroso mamange Ede amangoroso mande de de Ede aramaso de 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 ke de de estoro mamamanga Thank you Lord Jesus thank you Jesus let's go ahead take a step of faith to speak as the Holy Spirit gives you utterance. Even if it's one or two syllables, just go give voice to it. Speak. Speak. Those of you already praying tongues, pray. Pray. If you want to hold the hand of your neighbor and pray with them, do so. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are a community where the Holy Spirit has free flow. He's free. He's free to move in our midst as He desires. There is nothing restraining, nothing holding him back. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God. Thank you. Oh God, we praise you, we adore you, we glorify you, we magnify you, God. We thank you for the move of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for new things, for new wine being poured out upon your people. Thank you for a fresh anointing, for a reviving, for our Lord God and, and a stirring up of the things of God in our midst. Thank you, O oh God, for stirring up things in our midst. Thank you, O oh God, for the flame being kindled of a fire, bigger fire, bigger flame, fanning the flame. Thank you, O oh God. We praise you. We honor you, O oh God. And we bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. How many of you for the first time, for the first time, prayed in tongues here this morning? Can I see your hand? For the first time, you started praying in tongues. Just wave your hand at me. How many of you here for the first time? Just wave your hand at me. You started praying in tongues. First time. Anyone here? I can't see any hands. Any hands here? I see one, two. Anyone else? For the first time? Anybody else? Just wave your hand at me. Beautiful. Okay. 
But I want to encourage all of us today to spend much time praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues. It's a great way to pray. You can spend hours in praying in tongues. The Lord was gracious. As a 13-year-old, He baptized me in the Holy Spirit. And I can tell you, nobody forced me to do it. It was not hypnotism. It wasn't mind washing or brain washing. None of that. It was real. And from that day till now, it's more than 40 years. I've been praying in tongues. It's been great. And it can happen to you. Amen. Just say, Lord, I open my life. I want to pray. So I encourage all of us to do that. Let's rise up to our feet, please. Thank you for your patience. I know we've gone over time this morning. Father, we thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your ministry. By the power of your Spirit, God, let every chain be broken, every yoke be removed off of our lives. Let people be healed by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Backs be healed, lower back, right down the lowest point of your back, the, the, the joint that's been hurt, be healed in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for your healing virtue. Bones be healed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bones are coming into alignment, being healed. Vertebrae have been he damaged, being healed. Discs being healed. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for healing us, making us whole right now. Thank you, God, for your healing virtue, touching us, making us whole. Thank you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit continue with each of us always. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.